We all know running back is probably the most important position in fantasy football. Today we're talking about the ones that really matter, not the obvious top guys, but running backs 11 through 20. What was the truth of Damian Harris? What was the truth of Devin Singletary? What is their outlook going forward into next year? Stay tuned, like the video, subscribe, and enjoy all off season. This new year, focus on what's truly important to you and let HelloFresh take care of dinner. With fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and recipes delivered to your door, get 16 free meals plus three gifts with the code FOOTBALLER16 at HelloFresh.com slash FOOTBALLER16. And Foot Clan, you should join the four million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with all their personal grooming. And with our exclusive offer, you can go to Manscaped.com and use the code FOOTBALLERS20 to get 20% off and free shipping. Inside the Performance Package 4.0, you're going to find the signature Lawnmower 4.0. Oh, they're up to 4.0 now. It, and it is great. The electric trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. It's going to keep you safe. Advanced skin safe technology reduces your cuts. You don't want mistakes nicks. there. No, 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 no. Protect yourself, but take care of yourself. But don't Groom wreck well. Yourself. And you want to know what's going to help you? Hmm. A 4,000 K LED spotlight. You want to you want to shave in the dark? You can do it. You don't need to, but you could do it with the Lawnmower 4.0. Manscaped has everything you need, a travel bag, body wash. It's awesome. Get 20% off at free shipping with the code FOOTBALLERS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code FOOTBALLERS20. Welcome. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Thursday, January 27th. Part two of the truth episodes on running backs. Jason Moore is here. Excited to be here. Jay Gray is <laughs> angry to be here. I'm Andy Holloway, and we have Al Borland in the house today. What's up, Foot Clan? And the Borgogan is here in studio. Hello. <laughs> and that was you're so gonna work. You're gonna need to work on that. on the intro on the welcome. Uh, that was friendly. Yellow. Uh, he comes from a, I mean, comes from Georgia. They're friendly down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Friend, friendly down in the south. Yeah. He's, he got a lot of y'alls. Uh, he does. He's never going to lose the y'alls, I don't think. No, it's part of who he is. And we don't do a lot to kind of institute strong English language skills around here. I'm doing my best to tear those abilities down. <laughs> so uh, Mike should be back with us uh, on our next episode. We'll be digging into some of the very interesting running back names on today's show, Jason. Yeah, I mean, this is really where it, it gets very interesting to look at um, not necessarily the top-end running backs, but the the ones that really mattered and maybe they were better in the second half of the year or got off to a strong start and Ooh. disappeared. And we need to know, like, what is the truth of their outlook going forward? Yeah, because we're going to have a – you know, new set of rankings before you know it, heading into 2022, and uh, we'll we'll figure out the truth today. We did get some Sean Payton news. That's really the big headline news-wise for fantasy players. Sean Payton's going to step away temporarily, perhaps. I listened live to almost all of his 90-minute press conference, um, which was very different. It's a bit long. Yeah, it was. A, it, he started it off by saying, "Like I'm going to take everybody's questions. I, I'm going to be here a while." And I was like, "Really? Is that true?" Yeah, yeah. That, that's what he said, and, and he stuck to that. Uh, he was there for a long while, shared a lot of stories, uh, really made the moment about himself. I we we will be losing the Sean Payton loves Taysom Hill, and so Taysom Hill will get playing time narrative. We're losing the Sean Payton anything narrative as he is gone, other than the Sean Payton rumors to other teams which won't happen this year but he literally said in his press conference he said I'm not I don't like the word retire 
And I'll be honest with you, coaching is probably in my future again. So, like, he's going to come back coaching. And teams will offer – I mean, he's – you He's know. under contract with the Saints through 2024, so if he, he was to return, you would likely get a situation. The best one I can think of is the Gronkowski situation, where he was under contract with the Patriots, retired for a year to avoid a trade to the Lions, and then came back, and they worked on kind of a – I don't remember what the pick was, but it wasn't a lot to get him to Tampa Bay, and I think the same thing would happen. A lot of rumors about Dallas, mm -hmm. right, and uh, maybe a, a year from about now. about Arizona – from you yeah so there was another thing that happened during the weekend's games that we didn't bring up and i just didn't know if you saw it or had a, an opinion on it well let's hear but um did you see the the whole champagne thing with patrick mahomes's wife no but i, I can't wait to hear so uh i want you to see this live here so i sent it to you just now you can take a look at it um his wife was up in a suite, and they won the game, and she's busting open champagne. Okay, and I'm then, seeing it. And then the champagne, she just douses the crowd beneath her. <laughs> just just complete. pouring champagne on Congratulations, everyone. You've been championed by Patrick Mahomes' wife. So is this... This is controversial because people think that this is like a very rude thing to have done. Right. Like, you know, you're in the locker room, you get champagne on, you take a quick shower, you're done. These people are there in the cold. They're doused to champagne. They got to walk back to their cars. I mean, do you think who this was appropriate? I do. Okay. I think this is appropriate. Right. Who hasn't had beer accidentally spilled on them every game you go to? Here, you're all celebrating. Everyone's That's going, how I kind of feel. Everyone's going nuts. And then afterwards, you might be upset for a second. You might be like, oh, my gosh, what? Oh, oh, oh yeah. But Matt what Mahomes. about, I mean, there had to have been a handful of Bills fans down there. Oh, good. That's what, oh, that's, okay. I mean, that's <laughs> what you get. Not exactly controversial to you. No. Made too much of it. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, real quick before we move on from Sean Payton, what effect does this have on Alvin Kamara, one of the best running backs? We talked about him uh, last episode because I do think this signals um, a teardown, if you will. I don't. They were already on their way down without Drew Brees. They didn't make the playoffs. Uh, you dealt with Michael Thomas's injury and really an anemic offense entirely. But without Jameis, his injury, without Taysom, his injury, without head coach. You're going to have a bad offense next year. Like that's a that is a guarantee from from me. They Terrible will cap be a, situation. They will be an awful offense next year. And we just talked about on last episode the value of drafting players with great quarterbacks who are on winning teams. Yeah, so, Alvin Kamara is going to be a difficult call because his utilization and the way that they were dependent on him. Like that, that goes out the window. You just don't know what the next play caller is going to bring to the table, like you said. And and you're in a division where it, it's just hard to see that future with the existing players working out. And so then you talk about teardown and you talk about an elite runner, right? I mean, Alvin Kamara is great. He's under contract. I mean, it scares me. Yeah, I mean, the I I guess it's too early to know and prognosticate, but it is a good reminder that. Soon, in a in a month or two, when all the coaching changes have happened, we will have a very important off season episode on the coaching changing uh, coaching changes update and what the outlook is going forward. Because you know you're listening right now, this time of year, which means you're an avid fantasy football player. You know the impact that these coaches make on these teams, and um, we'll talk all about you know Ben McAdoo. Oh, do we have to? Well, we don't have to now, but we will then. What's crazy is you have a division now with, and you you brought this up, Matt Rule. Ah, uh, the murder. the fan the fan sentiment around Matt Rule, who would, might bring in Ben McAdoo, um, it's not great. And then you have Tom Brady, who if he retires, which could happen, mm -hmm. it, sounds it. He's definitely got people scared. Do you have? Is Matt Ryan the best quarterback in the division? <laughs> no. He is though. If Brady retires, he is. I name a Panther. Name a Saint. Uh, okay. Name I, a Buccaneer. Not name Tom Brady. Uh, that's easy. I I know that this will sound hot takey. I don't think it is. If you say Sam Darnold, no, I'm not okay. going to say Sam Darnold. I really, truly liked Kyle Trask who was the rookie last year, who was drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who just spent a year behind Tom Brady. He's not better than Matt Ryan. 
at this stage in their career, if it. I, well, put it this way. If I was a GM and I had to take one of those two guys, I would take Kyle Trask. No, over that's, Matt Ryan. that's lunacy. No, I'm building for the future. Yeah, but that is. What a, does Matt Ryan do for you? He does something that Kyle Trask has never done, which is some stability and, and moves the ball. And like, we just don't know what Trask is. Sure. You, but, you liked him, but. Eh, he could be nothing. All right. It's, it's a weird division is all I'm saying. Like anybody from that division, if Brady walks away, anybody could be on top of it. Genuinely sure. next yeah. year. Um, all right. Let's uh, remind the listeners. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Follow Jason at Jason FFL. Mike is at FF Hitman. I'm at Andy Holloway. We're on YouTube. You can subscribe over there. Click the bell. That's YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballers. And we are not far from Super Bowl Sunday. And the UDK pre-sale begins on Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, we uh, I've seen a lot of questions from people about what are the top tips for a dynasty player in their first full off season, and uh, a lot of that is going to be looking at uh, rookie profiles and getting used to the names before the NFL draft. We'll have a lot of the information if you get the UDK Plus on Super Bowl Sunday. That will already on that day come out with the dynasty pass, and so you'll have access to really start looking into next year's players today. Yeah, team needs. What are these teams going to be looking for in the draft? The fallout of free agency, the NFL draft, it's significant. Depth charts, long-term dynasty value of players. You you saw last year, we were all projecting, oh, Atlanta's going to end up with a running back or Miami's going to end up with a running back. Those teams didn't. You were surprised with the James Robinson news with, with Travis Etienne. Um in, and so you have different values that change really, and you have to shoot your shot. I mean, we're going to have lots of takes on this show where it's like, Hey, do you believe in this guy long term? But that's going to help your research. And that's coming very, very soon. Let's get into the truth. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. The Saints are moving to Kevin James as their new head coach, by the way. Did you really? know that? I did, I did not know. That is breaking news. He has a tremendous amount of experience. Playing Sean Payton. Playing Sean Payton. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Uh, Looks just like him. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get past. If you, if, if you don't know what we're talking about, Kevin James played, and this is the... Uh, the Plays. Right. This is the phenomenal actor uh, who brought you Paul Blart. <laughs> right, uh, King of Queens. Um, I, yeah. I do like him, but he played Sean Payton in a Netflix uh, movie that just came out. And mm. I have you watched it? No, no, I haven't because of the resemblance. I issue. couldn't get past <laughs> pretending that Kevin James is Sean Payton. Like I just couldn't do it. I couldn't make that leap. Okay, it's yeah, ridiculous. I mean that makes that makes some sense. <laughs> stung by some bees. Uh, <laughs> All right, back into the truth of the running back position. If you missed the last episode, we went through the top 10 running backs by Fantasy Finish. We looked at the percentage of games that they had 21 or more points. That's what we define as a great game. 11 or more is good. Seven or fewer is bust. And we don't count missed games against their consistency score. We're looking at games that they were actually out there on the field. What did they give you when you counted on them, when you put them in your fantasy lineups? And so we went through Jonathan Taylor and Joe Mixon and Eckler and – um you can go listen to that. Today, we're going to go from number 11 on down the list, and we'll start with Nick Chubb, who ended up at 11. His consistency rank was actually 15, which is, um, I think, a huge disappointment compared to what people expected. First half of the year, 11th. Second half, 21st. This was not what you – really, this is not the season you wanted from Nick Chubb if you drafted him. No, it's not the season you wanted from the Browns. And when we're talking about what is the truth of Nick Chubb, of Kareem Hunt, I believe that the truth is you have to look at the beginning of the season and project that forward more than the end of the year. It was week seven when Baker Mayfield missed with the shoulder injury that happened in week six. So really, the first five weeks of the season were the Browns as – you would hope going into next year if if Baker is healthy um, and, and the team is playing well. And at that time, Nick Chubb was was pretty good. He had, you know, three of those five weeks were top 10 running back performances. And during that same time, Kareem Hunt was 
dominating. So the the run game was working, the offense was working. They were a much better team before that shoulder injury to Baker. Chubb kind of represents the non-pass catching running back scenario for your fantasy team. He had a higher percentage of great games than everybody except for Mixon and Jonathan Taylor. But you know, when 36% but then you look at the other games, and he had the ability to disappear. He only had 20 receptions on the year. We know the story with Nick Chubb. So you you got these games that won you weeks when you had him, but then you had disappearing acts when the, the offense wasn't functioning, like you said. Yeah, and, that, and that's the worry with anyone that doesn't catch the passes is they, they're not game script proof. Um, there can be games where they completely let you down. You will have that with Nick Chubb. And the worst that the Browns are, as a as a team, the more that those game scripts are going to be bad and they need to throw the ball and it's not Nick Chubb's forte and, and, and he's off. You know, he was on a 17-game pace of 276 carries, and that's not what you want from a a true ground and pound. You're saying you want more? Yeah, you want 300-plus carries for someone that's not going to catch the ball. 1,259 yards, eight touchdowns. There's no debate that he's one of the best pure runners in the game. I mean, from a running back perspective, I, there aren't – you know, you put him in the Indianapolis behind that line this year in that system, you get the same production, I think, as Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, sure. I, I agree. He's, he's got every bit of the talent. However, in this offense and the way they utilize him, I think I would rather draft Kareem Hunt next year. Not, not for the same value, but for where Kareem Hunt's going to go in the draft. Kareem Hunt had 187 carries, 803 yards, and five touchdowns. He was 45th fantasy-wise, um, 34 receptions, missed a ton of games, obviously. I mean, before he went out to injury, his the first six weeks of the season, there was only one game where he wasn't an RB2 or better, and he had a couple monster games. So, so then do, do you want to live in, like just philosophically as a fantasy player, do you want to live in this world? Or like, would you be comfortable with Nick Chubb as your one? No. Okay, and then do you want to even mess around with this universe, this this dual back universe? I would rather have Kareem Hunt for a value later in drafts than Chubb. Chubb is someone. Are you I will... fine with Hunt as a two? Your RB two, actually yeah, I, on your I, roster. I am fine with Hunt as my RB two. He is still extremely talented, um, consistent, much more game script proof. Because if they're down, he's going to be catching the ball, and if they're up, he could be part of the reason why. Yeah, consistency-wise, Kareem Hunt was 22nd, Chubb was 15th, and uh, despite missing a ton of uh, games, he still ended up with 34 receptions. All right, Aaron Jones came in at 12. This is another season that needs reviewing. 17th in consistency, got better in the second half of the year, was 11th in the second half. Um, Pretty much the same against good and bad defenses, same at home and on the road. Six most running back receptions, ninth most red zone touches. That's How do you feel about this season awful. from Aaron Jones? This season feels like he kind of pulled a rabbit out of the hat to me. I, I feel when I, when I f just think about Aaron Jones, you drafted him, you relied on him, I feel extremely disappointed, which is crazy because he was the running back 12. He wasn't terrible. But I think you know you were hoping He's you drafted had, as the running back seven. Yeah, I mean you were you were hoping first round pick that you had you know the previous two years he was a top five running back, um, really dominant seasons. And what happened this season was really a an AJ Dillon problem. If it was if he did the same season, but AJ Dillon wasn't coming strong onto the scene. I think the outlook for Aaron Jones would be better, but I worry that as time goes on, it's going to be more and more split. Yeah, it's a. I think that's the right worry to have, and this is a devil you knew versus devil you didn't know situation. People were twisting the departure of Jamal Williams into, well, Aaron Jones is just going to be a monumental pass-catching running back. He's going to take over a lot of third downs. They're not going to trust Dylan. And what really happened is Dylan got almost, I mean, Dylan got more carries on the year mm -hmm. than Aaron Jones did. So that's step one of evaluating the situation is A.J. Dillon ended up with more total carries, more total rushing yardage, more total rushing touchdowns. And, and the second half of the year, they started using A.J. Dillon in the passing game. He had 47 targets. Um, uh, that's 
that or that would that would be his pace from the second half of the year. I think it was I think the real season was worse than the outcome. I think Aaron Jones salvaged the entire year with six receiving touchdowns compared to two for Dylan. Otherwise, you could argue Dylan had a better year. And yeah. you certainly got better value drafted as the running back 34. Where does Aaron Jones go in next year's draft? This year he was a first round selection, back of the first. How far does he fall going in? How far would he need to fall for you to confidently take him, given the fact that the changeover, the the new incumbent getting more carries and more work, where would you feel comfortable grabbing Aaron Jones? And this is obviously assuming Aaron Rodgers is back as a Packer, because otherwise yeah. he tumbles for all, ever. My, I actually don't have as much concern. Like I'm comfortable taking him uh, right around RB10. Really? Yes. Oh, man. Because I don't think anything's going to change between this dynamic. I don't think you go into next year. I don't think A.J. Dillon did anything that's going to take more work from Aaron Jones. What I actually would be concerned about as a fantasy player is weapons beyond Devontae. If the team adds pass-catching weapons beyond Devontae that the general world thinks are good, that will siphon the work that's valuable for Aaron Jones. You just looked at this last game. It was what is whatever 11 targets for Devonte Adams 10 for Aaron Jones one for everybody else that's the valuable asset that Aaron Jones represents is the five or six receiving touchdowns I'm not concerned about like I don't think we're going to go into next year and AJ Dillon is going to further dwarf the rushing work of Jones I think he does I think AJ Dillon has proven himself as the season went along and coming into year three I, th I think he gets more rushing work um and that you know that's just how that's how I view it. So I I would be really scared to take Aaron Jones in the top ten. Obviously, he's I mean, very just, very they talented. They just paid him a ton of money, and I didn't see anything on the field. That, no, this wasn't Aaron Jones. We don't like you, so we're putting AJ Dillon out there to me. Correct. This was just finding the balance, and he still looked great. I mean, Aaron Jones is a very talented running back. He didn't look like he's old busted. I just worry if his opportunities keep going down. It's very difficult for, you know, uh, uh, to draft a guy at 10 who had 171 carries. You're not even hitting the 200 number. Yeah, I mean, that's the Alvin Kamara formula is, is getting what he missed a couple games this year. Aaron Jones did. So, uh, yeah, played So 15. you're probably close to that number. What's his what's his career high in carries? We should look that up. Uh, his career high is two hundred and thirty six. Okay, so he he had over two hundred the previous two seasons, and then was down at one seventy one this last year. Alvin Kamara is definitely the comp, and ironically, it's always been that you know they had Alvin Kamara. So had is the Austin Eckler. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but maybe these situations mirror themselves, where you're going to be more comfortable with the Cream Hunt and AJ Dillon than you will be with Nick Chubb and Aaron Jones. I I, th I think you are completely correct. I would rather have the pass catching specialist in both, but one of them is cheaper and one of them is more expensive than Aaron Jones. So I uh, AJ Dillon will be more inflated ADP wise under this narrative than Kareem Hunt will be. Yes. Kareem, Kareem Hunt situation has been there for a while. Ag agreed. And Kareem Hunt was injured the second half of the year. Kareem Hunt, I think, will be a really good value next year. I don't think there's anything you can say to change that. I the, think you're absolutely right. The Browns were bad. They yep. dealt with injuries. Baker looked bad. Uh, nobody's going to be clamoring over themselves to get Kareem Hunt, and I'll happily scoop him up. He drops to the sixth round. I'll, I'll, I would love to grab um, someone that is as talented as him and as good a pass catcher in the sixth. Now it'll be a whole different story if Aaron Rodgers leaves, which he did say that, like you said on yesterday's or uh, Tuesday's show, well before free agency we will know. That's what his co quote was. I'm going to hold you to that, Aaron. Right, yeah. Uh, we're going to get into number 13 on the list, Damian Harris, momentarily. We want to thank our friends at Code Academy for supporting this podcast. Maybe out there you're listening. It's been a tumultuous couple of years. Maybe you want to change your career. Maybe you want to uh, shift gears. There's never been a better time than right now to become a programmer. With Codecademy, you can learn to code on your own terms. Uh, I, you know, having worked in the tech industry for a, almost 20 years, I want to think of programming, or I, I think of programming as opening doors for yourself. Mm -hmm. In the world of technology, career opportunities, and entrepreneurship, it enables you to do a lot if you have an idea and you want to do something. And Codecademy, there's over 50 million people 
that have used Code Academy to learn to code with job ready coding skills right at your fingertips there. Um, you learn at your own pace, you get great instructors. You've got to check it out. You can join the over 50 million people learning to code with Code Academy and see where coding can take you. Get 15% off your Code Academy Pro membership when you go to codecademy.com and use the promo code. Can you guess it? It's, it's ballers. Oh, man. That's promo code ballers at codecademy.com to get 15% off Code Academy Pro, the best way to learn to code. C O D E C A D E M Y dot com, promo code ballers. And Foot Clan, if you haven't heard about Paint Your Life, it is an incredible gift idea that you need to know about. And you're going to think, oh, man, it's probably really expensive, except it's not. You can get professional hand-painted portraits created from any photo, and it's a truly affordable price. We've used it in the studio. We have a charcoal uh, you you could choose different kinds. You want watercolor, uh, oil. Uh, you want to combine charcoal, photos together. Sketch. Well, that's one of the coolest parts. Uh, you could take a a picture of people that aren't together and just highlight which people you want to paint into one portrait. Whether uh, it's someone that might not be around anymore, and you can put them into um, a, a a great portrait you Piece can of art. do your children your family a special place a uh, cherished pet uh, you can do basically anything and it's a very easy user-friendly pat platform and at paintyourlife.com there is no risk if you don't love the final painting your money is refunded guaranteed and right now there's a limited time offer you can get 20 percent off your painting 20 percent off and free shipping and to get the special offer you text the word football to 64,000. that's football to 64,000 text football to 64,000 paint your life celebrate the moments that matter most terms apply available at paintyourlife.com slash turns terms again text football to 64,000 what do you think of Damian Harris I when I say the name Damian Harris do you think he's 13 finished at 13 oh man that's really young <laughs> I thought for sure he was in his 20s <laughs> I worry now for his health. Yeah, he's he's one of the youngest running backs in the history of the league. Um, it is surprising that, that <laughs> Damian Harris uh, finishes the running back 13. I, I don't think most people would assume. He um, was the fifth most consistent running back in the second half. He he was really, really good. And I think that um, the big games from Ramondre Stevenson, uh, the new rookie coming in, scare people away you had both right yes. you you had the experience of having both on your roster and having to make the decision and um you dealt with an injury right in the prime time of the year right after the bye week he missed a week but as good as Ramondre was when given the opportunity in the games when both played you could tell who was better yes. and it was I mean Damian Harris was great um you know if, if it wasn't for that hamstring injury in week 15 I, I think he would have won a lot of people championships because the end of the year, even you know around that missed game, he was really amazing. He would have been a thousand yard rusher in that case. He ended up with um, two hundred and two carries on the year, four point six a carry was definitely part of the machine that was the Patriots' offense. Bumped up the consistency in the second half, second half of the year, like I said. Didn't catch passes. I mean, that's not what he does. 18 catches, 132 yards. Ramondre is a little bit more versatile. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's going to be tough evaluating this situation, too, because I think the team likes Damian Harris a lot. They obviously invest the draft capital in Ramondre. They make a nice one-two punch, but you also have, I, it's going to shock you, James White plays football. That is a name that I forget about. And and he's under contract, right? That For is next right. year yeah. with the Patriots. Great pass catching running back. He'll be back. He'll be involved. Um, and right now you only think of it as the the one two punch, the Damian Harris Ramondre Stevenson. Um Damian Harris scares the scares the tar out of me. There's a, a a little memory here that Kyle found. Apparently we bullied Mike into making Damian Harris a top nineteen running back because we had moved him up um Oh, nice. Inside the top 20, and we bullied Mike into doing that. Good for us. We were right. Yeah. You're so, so smart. And then Mike tried to respond to the bully by being facetious and made the, the outlandish comment to say that, well, then fine, Damian Harris will 
finish higher than Christian McCaffrey. And he did. And he did. That is true. Um, yeah. Going forward, uh, I we just talked about it with Nick Chubb. It's hard to it's hard to rely on someone who doesn't catch passes, and Damian Harris doesn't. He is a great runner. He was very consistent, but can he keep this level of consistency going forward if he's not catching the ball? No, I, it, it also speaks to your point about the Browns being a good team and will the Patriots be a good team because against bad running defenses, Damian Harris smashed them. He scored twice as many fantasy points against bottom 16 Ds than the top defenses. Why? Because the top defenses slowed down the running game enough to where Brandon Bolden was taking tons of third downs or they were playing catch-up in the games. You didn't get weak winning performances from Harris very often, but you did get 60% good games, 13% great, 20% bust. Well, and part of, the, part of the reality is teams with top defenses are more likely to be in the game, to be winning the game. Right. Um, and when you are losing the game on the other side, that's when Damian Harris comes off the field. That's when Damian Harris is going to put up eight fantasy points because they need to throw the ball. So I, I worry about him because you could have Ramondre Stevenson coming into year two, get more involved, more work, James Robinson coming in. So it's it's funny. He The truth of this season was that Damian Harris was great. He was consistent. He was a value in your drafts. He helped people win a championship. Turns 25 next month. He's young. He's on an improving good offense on a good team. you sell him high in Dynasty? I don't know that you can. I, I would if I if can, I could cash in for a, a lot of value. Um, I think I would be willing to do that because he does scare me long term. I could see this next year him being far more irrelevant than he was this year, and then that's already the beginning of the end. I agree with that. They they gave they showed that once Ramondre established, they would just give him drives, mm -hmm. and so he'd be the the first and second down runner on an, an entire drive. So the goal line is what's really going to matter because he had 15 touchdowns. Yeah, he had the sixth most goal line carries. So if the offense gets better. If he, he owns that role next year. And he should. He'll he be, very good. He'll, he'll actually end up a value. He will. Um, I, I think I'm skeptical that his consistency will stay if he's not a pass catcher next year. Where where does he go in, in drafts? He was drafted as the running back 26 this past year. A lot of doubt of the, of, about the offense having any value, I think. Um, I think he's drafted as a probably a late RB2. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I guess at that value, he'll probably outperform it. I, I'll bet he's a top 15 running back. Yeah, he could be one of those players that you, you're worried about James White's return. But really, that's what Bolden did. Yeah, the, he, James White doesn't really affect uh, – James White could affect Ramondre Stevenson – but I don't think he affects Damian Harris that much because there's totally separate roles. Yeah, there's just more, like Nick Chubb, there's more pathways to failure if you're sharing a backfield with other talented running backs and you don't catch any passes. Yeah, you need to catch passes to be truly consistent and have a great year like the next guy finally, finally did. Josh Jacobs, running back 14, great pass catcher, finally got 64 targets, 54 receptions, and was involved in all f facets of the Raiders' offense. Yeah, he, he was uh, 14th by fantasy finish, but 9th by consistency. So I, I don't know if this is the first... This is probably the first time in his career where his consistency rank outperformed his fantasy finish. And first half of the year, he was 4th most consistent running back, but didn't really have any prolific games. The second half of the year, he was 17th. But I think that's because he had a full dud against Kansas City. Twice. Uh, but he had some top performances. I mean, ended the year. This is one of those games you probably ignore, but he's six against the Chargers to end the season. He did look really good in the playoffs, too. I mean, he looked like he had figured some things out. Don't know if he's going to have the same head coach, but 54 receptions. Yeah, I mean, he, he was very involved. You had some injuries to the other running backs there, but uh, he... He's only been good his whole career, and he's always disrespected. If he can be involved in the passing game, he is someone that I think will be of value next year. Do you worry about any of the other influences around him? 
the success of the offense, the types of things that we were talking about the other day? I, I think this offense can only get better next year. I don't see – this was an offense that lost pieces. They lost Henry Ruggs. They lost Darren Waller for a large stretch of time. They lost Kenyon Drake to they, a broken ankle. Yeah, and, and as – as they go into next year, assuming that they don't trade Derek Carr and do some kind of complete blow-up situation, which I don't think they would, I think Josh Jacobs is in line. He's still only 24 years old. He was he came into the NFL as a very young dude, and he, he's he's talented. If he's using all three facets, which he is right now, um, I, I I think he's going to be a great great draft pick. Lots of information we don't have, but let's just put you in a hypothetical draft in August. Right here, right now, are you are you investing in Josh Jacobs or are you investing in the preceding two names, which is Damian Harris and Aaron Jones? I would definitely take Josh Jacobs ahead of Damian Harris. Um, assuming that Aaron Rodgers is back, Aaron Jones, I would, I would take Aaron Jones ahead of Josh Jacobs at the same draft spot, um, but I would imagine Aaron Jones will be drafted quite a bit ahead of Josh Jacobs. Because Kyle, of the name. you're on the mic, right? Yes, sir. Do they still have to pick up the fifth-year option on Josh Jacobs? Yeah, they, we still have to find that out. Okay. All mm. right. All right. Can Did, work on... Yeah, was he gargling I think he was. I think he was Did maybe Listerine. Was a mouthwash? Did we have Listerine back there? Oh, he's got a mask on. Oh. Now I feel bad. He's just trying to protect people. Oh, that's kind. Huh. Don't... Do you have any don't Listerine? Don't Listerine... <laughs> With while the wearing, you don't need to do both at the same time. Right. I would take the mask off, swish, spit, <laughs> then you can put the mask back on. I think that was the real problem. Here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, 15th, Dalvin Cook. Consistency rank of 10. What to make of this year for Dalvin Cook? I mean, it was littered with injuries, but not the kind that knocked you out for the whole year, just the kind that got you disappointed and then surprised he was back and then frustrated again and then – he lost me a championship with the worst performance probably of his career with two points against Green Bay, and he only needed nine, and I would have been singing, and I would have been pouring champagne on people that didn't want it poured on them. Mm. But you didn't win? No, no, no. no oh, no, I'm no. sorry. You know who well, would have won? Uh, that would be Al. It, the other thing is if Damian Harris didn't tweak the old hammy, I think Ramondre went on to score about 30 points the rest of the way. See, you and I had different experiences in championship week because you had Damian Harris who put up 14 points 18. in the first quarter yeah, 18. and then went on to do nothing. Yeah. I played against Damian Harris yeah, yeah, yeah. who didn't do anything in the second half and I, I won my champion. No, you got, well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, let's uh, talk Dalvin Cook. Yeah. Let's just shut the show down. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry sad. for your loss. Look, Dalvin Cook is a lot better than this finish, period. Yeah. And he'll be drafted higher than this finish as well. 23% great game, 62% good, 15% bust, new head coach, new GM. That's coming to the table for the Vikings. And, and really the whole situation here, Dalvin Cook will be a top five pick. Dalvin Cook should be a top five pick. He is worthy of it. Um, I don't think you can project injuries outside of the fact that the, his shoulder issue is a problem. Like the re-aggravation rate of his specific shoulder injury is high. But we saw him injure it, wear the device, come back and dominate. So I'm not too worried the about device. that. The real question with Dalvin Cook, and really I think the only thing we need to say about him is who's his quarterback? Because if it's if Chris if uh if Captain Kirk yes. is quarterbacking the Vikings, then they're gonna be the same. They're gonna be a good offense. Um they're probably gonna bring in a more offensive minded head coach, and Dalvin Cook is a great piece. So he he should be a top five pick if they trade Kirk. I want to put this to the test, scary. though, because you said you're presuming top five, but we know what the future is for Cincinnati. And so are you taking Dalvin Cook over Joe Mixon? Yes, for sure. Okay, so that I think that's where you start to get into interesting territory because of the uncertainty at the offense. Like, Mike Zimmer, if he was known for one thing, it was ending a game that he didn't win and knowing in his mind that the solution was to give Dalvin Cook the ball more. Maybe that new offensive mind that comes in there wants to let Kirk throw the football more. I think throwing the football more is better for an NFL offense, and if your offense is clicking, you will have just as many opportunities at the running back position. I don't see that being a negative for Dalvin Cook, and I don't know how many people you would take ahead of him. Obviously, you're going to take Jonathan Taylor. I'm taking Dalvin Cook ahead of Joe Mixon. Yes. 
I'm with you. You're taking him ahead of Zeke, Aaron Jones. This year was muddied by some outlier touchdown numbers as well. He he averaged a touchdown every 19 carries in 2019 and in 2020. Mm-hmm. He averaged a touchdown every 41 carries this year. He only had one multi-touchdown game the entire year. That is not... Dalvin-esque? No, no. And he was just as good against good and bad defenses. And he was just as good as previous years, too. You just watch, and he dominated. Oh, my gosh, that Pittsburgh game. He just didn't get into the end zone as much. He's also so. significantly better than Alexander Madison. Like Madison is firmly in backup camp. Yeah. For anybody who thought that, you know, Madison you could have had an A.J. Dillon situation. Madison is a great backup running back. Yes. Derrick Henry ended at 16 despite missing every week from week nine on, really week eight on with the injury early in the game. Consistency rank of number three. Was blowing away the field at the position is absolutely worthy of taking a chance at with the number one pick, in my opinion. If you don't want to go Jonathan Taylor or Austin Eckler, I think you can, in good conscience, go Derrick Henry. Um, because we of the identity, the commitment they have to Tannehill as the quarterback, um, he was the number one running back points wise until week 16 Kyle he was an RB1 for oh he was a, still an RB1 I see yes I mean 50 percent of his games were great that's 21 plus points I mean you just look at his game log here's his fantasy finishes through the year started poorly against our Arizona Cardinals remember the Titans got shellacked opening weekend and then from then on out Derrick Henry was the running back one 11, 4, 1, 1, and 12 through week 7. He was the best. He, he was, was the, the best to have. Absolute best. He was the best to have on your roster. That team that lost by a handful in the in the final championship game had him on it. It was so hard to lose him. He was an automatic great performance at the position every single week. When he was active through that stretch, he was not the running back one. He was far and away the running back one he was averaging 25 and a half fantasy points the the next best running back was Austin Eckler at 19.2 fantasy points Derrick Henry was I mean it, it would it would be nearly impossible to just constantly lose with Derrick Henry on your roster I only know one person who was able to do that and it was Kyle uh, <laughs> uh take a guess at the carries per game if you don't have it, don't look. I, I don't just, have it in front of me. Just take a guess. Seventy-two. No, all right. <laughs> okay. Take a better guess. Um, I it was it was I had to think it was outrageous. I would say twenty-six. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven is you're away. I was no. You didn't let me finish. Twenty-seven carries a game. So if you want to think about it, sure, he doesn't catch a ton of passes. He catches a few, and he can do a lot with them. And just give it's two running backs. 27 carries is two. He had 219 carries. How many did Aaron Jones have on a whole year? 171? Yeah. Eight games, 219 carries. was really seven games. I, so, I don't draft running backs that don't catch the ball other than Derrick Henry. He is an outlier. He is different. And I think that the whole narrative, the only question age. is age, injury. injury. I mean, he already came back. So I would imagine the injury is going to go away. He wasn't. His his regular dominant self in the in the playoff game, but that was one game. The fact that he came back means he's going to be fully healthy come the beginning of next year. But age is a question. You, I mean, he did miss half the season, and part of the issue when you get as much work as him is can the body stand up to that? It it couldn't this year. So there will be that conversation. It's a fair conversation because it will not go forever. You will not come into every draft with Derrick Henry being worthy of. His draft position. There will be a year where that doesn't happen. Yeah. I will, without a doubt, take him top three. It is so... Like, you can't... Even if he plays bad, you cannot put up a very bad number with 27 carries. You just can't. And, and he doesn't play bad. That's and, the best right. combo. And you can have 26 carries for one yard. And the 27th can go for 85 and a touchdown because he's faster than everyone else. So... It will be very interesting to see if he goes at three behind Eckler and those other names, or other name, Jonathan Taylor. Um, Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. Did you know they finished 17th and 18th this season? 
The consistency rank was 25 for Melvin Gordon, 31 for Javante. In the second half of the year, Melvin Gordon was still more consistent, 26th, Javante 28th. Who had more carries? Trick question. Mm. 203 on the dot for both of them. That's Who right. had more yards? Well, Melvin Gordon, 918 to a, a measly 903. I mean, this is comical. If Melvin you, scored four, twice as many touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, M Melvin Gordon was outstanding this year. It'll be really interesting to see if they bring him back. Wherever Melvin Gordon goes, he will be a value in drafts next year. If you he's believe back, that. Uh, 100%, because he's left for dead. Uh, he was, you Get know, ready, Atlanta. He wasn't drafted. Well, here I, he comes. Please. If here he, he comes. This he is like to Steven Atlanta. Jackson in Atlanta. If he went to Atlanta, he would be a great fantasy value because nobody's going to clamor over themselves to get a, you know, near 30 year old Melvin Gordon, but he was great. He looked really good. He's ob obviously very versatile, has a nose for the end zone, always has. Um, and if he comes back to the Broncos, I'll I'll still draft him because he'll plummet and fall as we all prognosticate that Javante Williams will overtake him and be the dude. I think the hope for everyone out there, though, is Melvin Gordon says, see you later, and go, goes to Atlanta. Go g Give value to two players here by exiting. Yeah, and, and for him, if he can get more than a one-year deal at good money, he'll depart because I don't know if they're going to give him that in Denver. I'm sure he wouldn't mind coming back there if they're the ones paying. But, I mean, the, the mirrors between these players is ridiculous. They were both 6% great games, 38 and 35% good games. It's silly. And so the future for Javante Williams is – the future is that if Melvin Gordon departs, you're going to have people paint the rooms gold or orange and blue and put Javante's name all over the place, and he'll be the sing – the singular most hyped running back in the draft possible. Yeah, he's someone that if Melvin Gordon were to leave, you could make an argument that he could and should be taken in those top five picks, that uh, what he is capable of. I mean, you know, on a per-touch basis, he was extremely efficient. He broke tackles better than everyone in the NFL. Uh, that was only his rookie year. So coming into year two with that talent, um, good offense. They're going to move away from a very defensive-minded head coach, which um, you know should be possibly better for Javante Williams. If he's alone, man, I will without a doubt take him in the first round. Yeah, he'll be worthy of it for sure. And he, you know, we profiled him in the dynasty pass last year as the tackle breaker. He ended up sixth in force missed tackles, despite splitting work and if you look at that i mean look at the carry totals in denver it's 406 yeah. carries between them yeah so you know is he a 250 270 carry rusher next year probably even if melvin gordon was back there could be a natural progression that happens there to 250 and he had 53 targets yeah. while being a split back if he could be someone on the field far more you could you could have him be someone that is an 80 target type of running back and those are those fantasy league winners the the running backs that are getting 250 plus on the ground and 75 plus targets yeah and and you add the opportunity with his talent he'd be outstanding are you trying to get him cheaper than his real value in dynasty i don't think it's possible man i i i think that those who drafted javante even though he didn't what if you take an aaron jones I would trade Aaron Jones for Javante Williams as quick as I right. possibly could in a dynasty league. So if you've got Aaron Jones, go try to make the move. Dalvin Cook? That's interesting. Wow. I would want to Is it time? I would want to wait and see if Melvin Gordon came back. Cuz yes. if Melvin Gordon comes Melvin Gordon comes back, then it will be split again and then you've got kind of this beginning of a career where you're seeing Javante as that. He doesn't get the opportunity to become the guy, so you're not sure he ever will. Okay, so let me. Let, who wouldn't you trade for uh, Javante? I, I because I'm sorry, Christian McCaffrey. I'm going to make you sweat if if Melvin Gordon <laughs> signs somewhere else. I would trade. Yes, I, yes. I would, all of these questions yes. are just. If we're going into the himself, season with, with Javante and Mike Boone. Okay, and that's what we're going into the year with. I would. Would you trade Christian McCaffrey for him? Yeah, if he okay. was by himself, I would. So then, who wouldn't you? Najee? 
uh, Naji, Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> Eckler? <laughs> I don't know, man. That's, uh, I mean, Javante was a true 21 year old this year, wasn't he? Was a 21 year old running back, I believe, which is. What's a false 21 year old? Well, I, I mean, he played his entire rookie okay, season gotcha. at the age 21, which historically, he was analytically, no, wait, that's Damian Harris. Analytically, that is a that's a big marker for uh, success for fantasy. And yes, right now he is still 21 years old. It seems like he is worthy of. I mean, you do have you have all these question marks, and yet the talent and the age is so in your face as a dynasty player. You know, you don't know who the quarterback is, the head coach. Right, mm -hmm. I mean, you, a lot of questions. So I do maybe think you that can team get is far cheaper. That team is built to. It's a turnkey offense for a new quarterback and a new head coach. You have three great wide receivers all all under contract, right? And you have an incredible running back. Yeah, and you got a good tight end uh, pair. So yeah, I mean, no, it's, the, it's turnkey. Yeah, the the skill. Tom positions. Brady should go to Denver. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers should go okay. to Denver. Yeah, no, I mean he could. DeAndre Swift at 19, consistency rank of 16. DeAndre Swift is someone I would not trade for Javante. In you, a you'd rather have DeAndre Swift. Because as of right now, we're more confident that he is we, – we know what, what he is more than Javante, <laughs> who has had to split time so far in his rookie year. I don't know. That one would be tough. Only 151 carries for DeAndre Swift to finish 19th. Well, sure, but he missed a month of action. So That was a point in his favor, Jason. Don't counter my good point. We were agreeing. Oh, oh I thought you were saying he only, only had. I said only 151 carries to get to 19. in the. You know, that's a, not a lot of carries. 62 receptions, missing time. Yeah. You know, the, he is a dynamic pass catcher that makes things happen in the open field. Now there's talk this week. Jared Goff's part of the future. Uh, he's under his contract says he is definitely part of the 2022 plans. I always, you you knew that as soon as the trade was completed, you knew he was going to be the starter for two years. You're taking Swift over Chubb, I assume, next year in the draft. Yes. You take him over Aaron Jones. Yes. Okay. You take him. What What are some of the names we mentioned last week? Um, you know, I'm not Joe gonna, Mixon or DeAndre Swift. I'm, uh, I would go Joe Mixon. I would go obviously the the higher end guys, the Ecklers. He's not in that tier to me in a a redraft or a keeper league. But the Lions, Swift over Saquon. Will yes, oh for sure. Over the last decade, here are the running backs with 100 plus receptions and 15 plus touchdowns in their first two years of the NFL. Ready? I'm ready. Saquon. Okay. CMC. He's good. Kamara. Great. David Johnson. Oh. Devontae Freeman, Le'Veon Bell, and now DeAndre Swift. So his recipe, like the recipe for DeAndre Swift is pure fantasy football dominance. Yeah. That's how he's built. I mean, he's built to be an 80 reception running back. So. And the Lions are going to get better as a team and as an offense. I'm not saying that they are going to be a great offense, but. They were no. You're right. Darn near as bad as you could have been, especially skill wise. I mean, you had Amon Ross St. Brown come through at the end of the year, really show a breakout. But look at the. We just talked about all the weapons in Denver. It's the exact opposite situation in Detroit, and it's got the Detroit odor to him. Like that happens where you just don't count on a running back, right? You the running backs haven't worked out in Detroit for a really, really long time. So is it easier to? acquire DeAndre Swift or Javante Williams in a dynasty league in your mind? I think it would be easier to acquire Javante. That's he how hasn't I, done I it think yet. so too. Yeah. And just the, um, yeah, I, I agree. 15% great game, 62% good, 31% bus was really good against top defenses. That speaks to the pass catching. I think mm -hmm. was the running back seven from week one through 11. Um, you had the guns Mahoney tease at the end of the year. We're going to get him back. We're going to – I mean, DeAndre Swift essentially wasn't himself from week 12 on. No, he was Because when he came back, injured. they limited him. So yeah. he, he's probably worthy of taking a chance at the Eckler type of season. Like, DeAndre Swift has a top five season in him. Well, before he got injured – I mean, so the injury happened the exact same time as Derrick Henry in week eight. 
so you look at that. That's a large part of the, that's the first half of the season. And during that part of the season, I talked about how Derrick Henry was so much better than everyone else behind him. But right behind him was DeAndre Swift. He was the running back three through the first half of the season. Um, that was with the bad Lions. So, yeah, DeAndre Swift is um, – the, the truth about DeAndre Swift is once he was injured and the Lions were on, you know, pace for – trying to get the number one, number two, number three NFL draft pick, they weren't going to bring him back and hurt his future. He is going to be very exciting next season. And he's a player where, you know, people take Eckler at RB2 or RB3, and you could get the same production out of DeAndre Swift, probably drafted RB7 or 8. Yeah, I, I would imagine you will not be getting the same amount of touchdowns. Right. Um, but outside of that, Yes. Devin Singletary rounds out the top 20 because he put it on display over the last four weeks of the year to get here. 188 carries, 870 yards, seven touchdowns, 50 targets, 40 for 228 and one. His consistency rank was irrelevant in the first half. He was the 45th most consistent running back. He was not good. Second half of the year, that jumped up to 14, but we're really talking about what is the truth of the last four weeks and the future. We have we have been here before with Devin Singletary. Have we? I don't we think that's true. Tell me when we were here. We were here with Devin Singletary before they drafted Zach Moss. Sure, the excitement, the what the, the future the, is Devin. Okay. The future it, is Devin. Part of life has existed before. Yeah, I did really like Devin coming out of his rookie year. Um Singletary looked talented to me as a rookie, showed enough to where I was excited. Then they went and drafted a running back that I thought was trash, but they drafted him with enough capital where it was like, great, now they're going to, now it's not the Devin Singletary show. And it took them another year and a half. I mean, the beginning of this year, they were trying everything at running back. They were one of the worst running teams in the league. Zach Moss had his games. Matt Breida had his games. It was like... You had, oh, healthy scratches from everybody. They yep. didn't know what to do. And then at the end of the year, it was like, wait a minute, this guy's way better. And I just don't know if we can rely on that. I believe he is far and away their best back. I think if they go into next season with the same roster they have now, he's someone that I would really like to have on my roster because this is a great offense. You want a running back with a great quarterback, with a great offense, he can catch the ball, he can score touchdowns. He's week, talented. Week 15 through the playoffs, six games for Devin Singletary, nine touchdowns in that spread. The Take, previous 42 games of his career were eight total touchdowns. I think there is a, a a philosophical decision that they are not going to live with Devin Singletary as their only running back. I do agree he's with 200 that. 200 pounds, five seven. I, I He's very talented, but I think that they will – if they don't think Zach Moss is the answer and they're going to – make this decision at the end of the year that he's just not even going to be active, then they'll find somebody else to be active with Devin Singletary that will make us all say they did it again. Yeah, I, I would not be surprised if in free agency or in the draft they go out and try to replace Zach Moss with a better one-two punch compliment to Devin Singletary because he's 200 pounds and they won't rely on him. But he can do it. He really can. And you take the touchdowns away. He was not – he was great – um, and the touchdowns obviously were part of why he was great. But if you took took those away and say, well, that's not really his cup of tea looking at his career up to that point, he was still on pace during that stretch for 1,649 all-purpose yards. So involved in the passing game, he's great. I don't – I think the truth is they're not going to utilize him next year the way that they did for this small stretch of the end of this year. It's great because the Bills now have a running back and wide receiver that we can just spend the entire offseason wondering, is the end of the year the real truth about Gabriel Davis? Oh, and that perform I mean, baby. that's, to be clear, Gabriel Davis' four-touchdown performance, 201 yards, was the greatest fantasy fin uh, performance in the history of the NFL playoffs. That was the greatest game ever and he, from a fantasy output standpoint. And, and part of the reason why is because he is great. That is my takeaway. I truly believe Gabriel Davis is great. I was going to be all about him this year, and then they went and freaking signed Emmanuel Sanders, who started off strong and looked great. But now they still use Cole Beasley. Dawson Knox broke mm -hmm. out. You still used Isaiah McKenzie a lot. You, I, you know, 
being great in one game. No, I think he's a great wide receiver. Um, there'll be a, that will be the debate of the. Uh, there's currently like uh, on my Twitter timeline is so hysterical because it is full of people saying the, sell both sides high, of it? buy at in, like it's he is the most divisive guy right now. And my personal opinion is I think he is a great wide receiver and he will be a strong fantasy asset with Josh Allen for the next four years. It's going to be a tough sell this yeah. offseason. On a, coming off a year where he caught 35 passes. you Great receivers. After two years in the NFL, do they catch more than 35 passes? Matt DeSorbo, um, uh, great great writer, he, he, was, uh, he did like a look at players who have oh, done I, this. I looked at it, yeah. It yeah, was 50-50, real small sample right, sizes. Right, very small sample sizes, guys. It didn't work out, but then you got the Jordy Nelsons that sure. kind of did this, and I just think the eyeball test. Back in the day, you and I, we were watching Stephon Diggs as this sure. less named guy in Minnesota. We're just like, man, that dude is great all the time. That's how I feel about Gabriel Davis. If I, you feel that way, you can get him easily. That's the truth. In Dynasty Leagues, you can get him very easily. Everyone is selling him. I've been offered him. This off season, people, you you get a four touchdown game. Mm -hmm. What do we say? You trade somebody, even if he ends up being halfway good. What's halfway good? Is it the is it the John Brown season in Buffalo? Is it the Emmanuel Sanders season in Buffalo? I don't think Dawson Knox is disappearing. This will be a very very interesting yeah. off season for the Gabe Davis talk for sure. Because obviously the eye test, he was great that game. Game. <laughs> game. Well, I mean the the real question you have to ask yourself is, do they believe him? Because yes. up until what was it? Week thirteen. He was a guy that was clearly running behind Emmanuel Sanders. You look at twenty eight percent snap percentages, thirty four, twenty five. He wasn't on the field that much. So you yep. say, oh, he he wasn't getting it done. He, he, low total volume. Well, he got it done at the end of the year when he was eighty three percent, ninety percent, eighty seven, ninety one. When that transition was made. So it's just a matter of was he not good enough to get on the field? They have to go into the year saying Gabe Davis is our number two. Yeah. And then at that point you can you can build the hype and you can make a you know the com the compelling case is you've got a very very good quarterback for a very long time. It would be like Mike Williams re-signing in mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Like why wouldn't you be attached to that player? Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, there are other names that we should talk about, um, but I think what we'll do is we'll break out some of these names that finished outside the top twenty in some quick questions over the next month or two. You know, I'd love to talk a little bit more about, you know, Elijah Mitchell in that season. And so we'll have to break down the truth on some of these other guys. We'll wrap today's show at the 20 running back mark. Nice. All right. Well done. And Mike will be back here with us for the next episode of the show. Talking wide receivers, probably not Gabe Davis. Probably not Gabe. Unless, it's, unless we're only looking at consistency over the final, <laughs> Playoff the final game. game. Yeah. yeah. All right. That'll do it for today's show. Thank you for supporting the podcast. And if you haven't, Take a moment on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a review. We read them. We're appreciative of them. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.